Annie, bonjour, good afternoon. My name is Kendra Campbell, and I'm the TD Curator of Education and Outreach Fellow here at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery. Before we begin, I hope you will join me in acknowledging the history, culture, and stewardship of the land of this region's indigenous people. Most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, a Mississauga Ojibwa First Nation. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live and work upon their traditional territory. In October, the power plant opened its fall 2018 exhibitions featuring an immersive sculptural experience by Carla Black, La Canicula with paintings by Vivian Souter and collages by Elizabeth Wilde, the second iteration of Abbas Akhavan's Variations on a Landscape, and of course, the second iteration of Beth Stewart's Length, Breadth, Thickness, and Duration. All remain on view until Sunday, December 30th. This afternoon, we are pleased to present our fourth and final artist talk. We invite you to stay after the talk and participate in a brief Q&A with the artist. Please join me in welcoming Beth Stewart. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I have many pieces of paper here. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to, I guess I'll start by giving what is the kind of requisite, um, often requested elevator speech about what my work is about. And, uh, it's, it's pretty, um, I, I feel like I've distilled it down to the, 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 the most kind of, um, true and, uh, and, and yet a uh, kind of obtuse um, statement, and that is that it's about figure ground relationships. Um, so, so I went, I went through some titles for this talk, and uh, we can cycle through them. The first one is, uh, the first one is The Politics of Stretch. They all felt a little bit, um, inadequate, but the second one would be getting wet. Negotiable boundaries, a cost-benefit analysis of spreading margins and leaky edges. And I settled on bond guard problems, which is um, a sort of pocket of interest of mine. Um, I came across bond guard problems through this very nerdy Buddhist podcast that I listened to called um, Deconstructing Yourself, which is hosted by a guy named Michael Taft. And uh, it's kind of about metaphysics and secu secular meditation. Anyway, so bond guard problems are essentially, um, they were developed in the 60s by a guy named um, uh, Mikhail Mosevich Bongard. And he, he, they're very kind of, um, it's this very simplistic system or format. Um, two parallel pages, usually with six boxes. And uh, the premise is that you, there is a, sing a singular solution to a bond guard problem, but essentially um, you're, you're supposed to f sort of figure out uh, what the difference is between one half and the other half. Um, they were uh, developed as a way of um, thinking about the complexities of um, human intuitive kind of creative creative problem solving. Um, most notably, they were adopted by a guy named, um, what's his first name, Henry Fondalis, who developed, was trying to develop a, 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 a software program, um, basically an algorithm, a simple algorithm that would teach computers, artificial intelligence, how to think creatively, um, basically trying to engage um, AI in, in, in a, some manner of intuition. And these, he, he, he took these problems on as a way of, if you could teach computers how to solve these, 
these problems, then um, it would go it would it would go a long way towards them. So, you I'm not I'm not letting you uh, necessarily solve these. We'll get to three that we'll get to three to look at three that we can sort of start to think about. Some of not all of these I have solved. Um, the 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 fact of the fact of having these kind of um, there's no there's no essential rule system for solving them. There's no there's no kind of parameters around what they necessarily need to look like. That the that the the figures would be rectilinear. That um, that they would have that they would be geometric. That they you know that they couldn't involve something that was image based. Um, and a lot of the kind of um, difficulty or um, energy in uh, solving these problems is around the kind of malleability of the mind and the, the, the I sort of liken it to looking for um, something that you want in Value Village. Like you have to kind of, you have to kind of develop this, um, you have to develop these kind of soft eyes to be able to um, start, start, of start to discern um, differences that may not be based on the first things that your mind go to towards as far as predictable patterns. So um, we'll just look at this one quickly, which is um, uh, pretty simple. Um, and I'm going to do this crowdsourcing thing <laughs> where I will shout out for the first person who is able to get this problem. And I'll wait. Yeah, Adrian. Okay. So again. It's performance anxiety. Uh, Mike. It it is again. It's it's three. Yeah, it's three. It's the three and it's a three and five kind of relationship again. Yeah, it is four and five. So, so the 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 reason why this one kind of comes up for me is because it, it does follow the same the same um, sort of system as the previous two. But your brain kind of wants to go to a, di a different zone because you've you've looked at the past two problems and um, sort of followed the orientation of where the points are, and you have to kind of think about. So, this is the answer was four and five for this one. Um, four on the left and five on the right. Um, and now you just have to pick it, find find the different spot in which the lines are kind of segmented. But um, anyway, this is just to kind of illustrate uh, um, the the lack of kind of rules or this principle of kind of soft eyes that I'm talking about. So the reason why this this um, this was coming up in this Buddhist podcast is because they were talking about the ability or the capacity to um, deal with intersectional thinking, essentially. So to deal with um, holding complex um, complex and conflicting identities, problems, um, uh, sort of sources and histories together in the world without kind of becoming foundationally nihilistic or 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 becoming fundamentalist. So, you know, to, to apply it in a kind of real world setting, they're talking about uh, the human tendency to veer towards um, the safety of uh, comprehensive systems. And the, the, the parameters, like the, the point at which we extend beyond those complex systems um, holding us or containing us is the point at which um, anxiety starts to develop, paranoia starts to develop. So what the potential, the potential for creative thinking is to allow our minds to kind of um, hold multiple, multiple intersectional truths at the same time. So they're talking about something that could be called meta-rationality. Um, uh, so, 
I'm going to start with the ground of the um, project that I am working on, that I have been working on. Um, so this, the seat of the research, there was a Victorian invention called the bathing machine. This was a rolling change room, um, a wooden box on wheels. It was pulled by a horse from shore just slightly into the water, carrying a fully clothed person of the emergent middle class, newly afforded holiday time. The bather would change inside and climb out the back end in relative modesty, often to be shepherded by a state or privately employed working class person of the same sex, offering a strong hand to the recently tender well enough to do. How bizarre and esoteric, you might say. Anomalous and quaint, not so. These things were quite ubiquitous uh, around for a century and eventually there were armies of them on the gen gender segre segregated beaches all over Europe and Australia and even North America. So here's the picture that I picture, the bedtime story. A standard member of the British gentry, a Victorian upperclassman. He is at the bottom of a, of a cliff, gazing aspiringly out to sea, to a sea that has recently started to sing a distant tune. Sounds romantic, that song. The faraway wilderness of colonial spoil. Disrupting the reverie, he hears above him a creak, and looking up, he sees the boulder of industrial capitalism poised to crash down upon his eminent self. He will, at the next strong wind, be buried under a mountain of unwashed common. There they are, suddenly, terrifyingly, armed with the unknown agency that means and leisure might afford. His first instinct is to run, but there are so many buttons. Bloomers with buttons, starched collar, buttons, shirting, shirting, buttons, buttons, waistcoat, frock coat, oh, and the pants. The pants, like a sadistic mock of a pair of tearaways, close buttons up each side from waist to ankle. Blessedly, his stockings alone are without buttons, but sealed as they are within his button boots, barely can he consider them boundlessly unbuttoned. And besides, when did he ever run? In his misty childhood, surely, but now? Adulthood. His stature is enumerated with these buttons, each one having its own hole, stitched safe by the hands that of that now feared other. With each insertion and the time it takes to render him properly held, he is assured of the righteousness of his place. He has felt so much comforting containment from all that concisely cinched cloth, so much support. But now, what is to be done? He's button bound. He looks again to the sea and thinks, perhaps, he could just climb back into the womb. There would need to be a special set of buttons for that journey. Oh, and perhaps a horse. Yes, a horse. It would solve the problem of the running. Boulder of doom forgotten, he sets off down the beach to commission what will surely be a fetching ensemble, fitting the fanfare of rebirth. Our dear Supreme Patriarch, Lord Musk, who in the adult daytime story is, n is none such Lord. He was just a Quaker merchant in a mid-sized British seaside town. Trying, in a mid-sized British seaside town named Benjamin Beale. He has become the inventor of this machine that will solve all the pesky moral and logistical problems of men and women together having an experience of their bodies in this brand new idea that is public. He says to himself, they're having a free time, having a leisure, let's make it wholesome. They can't afford the resort after all. Drawstrings, pragmatic as they are, beg a bit of dignity and a small fee they might pay to rent their modesty and perhaps will advertise that new soap factory of Cousin Ernest on the side of the boxes and jobs for the folks might need them, helping people have their fun, opportunity all around. And so this cartoon obscenity, a caricature of the human will to moderate social change. 
Problematic as it is, some sweet pathos in considering that this is one sort of ritual mitigation humans produced in the face of the tsunami that was emergent modern capitalism. On the pathos equivalency scale, it's more Oculus Rift, less border wall to be sure. But only the bedtime story makes it SpaceX. And bed bedtime stories are for heroes and villains, not the mid-tones of pragmatism and the grating, mundane persistence of ordinary desire. So much. Um, I'll just keep going through this material. Years ago, after I finished graduate school, um, I went to work for an old friend. He renovates uh, the houses, mostly of other artists. He was trained in Montreal to uh, plaster walls in a more traditional way than what's done now. I started training with him at the end of the renovation of the house of my uh, dear friend, Laurel who is now no longer with us. Um, I'd mix the plaster and serve it up as he moved through the house. He was kind of quickly applying the setting mix. To mix it, you make a big ring, forming a well of drywall compound, um, which is a version of old-fashioned lime putty. And you pour water into the well, taking care that it doesn't spill over the edges. You then sprinkle plaster of Paris into the well, evenly, all over the pool of water until there is little or no clear water, and it looks a bit like a cheese danish. You can then take slices of the pie, mixing them with a trowel until it's all one. The mix gets put on a plaster hawk, which is just a flat piece of metal with a handle on the bottom. If the plaster is too liquid, or there is too much water, or you chase it poorly, it easily escapes the edge of the mixing table or the hawk. You must constantly guard the edges of the spreading liquid, an entropic goo that flows towards the level line. But too much handling will bond it before it can get used, and settle it, setting happens fast in the first place. This engenders a certain amount of anxiety. You can scrape, you can push, you can slide, you can slap, constantly moving to keep it between liquid and near solid. What happens around the margins of this turbulent action is a very messy. This is just a diagram of the um, uh, historical version of the bathing machine. And this is an image of um, a tool, uh, a behavioral psychology tool for uh, children to begin to develop um, emotional interoception. So particularly children who, um, who struggle with emotional regulation. And what interoception is, is basically it's a kind of sense of the way that the, um, the way that the, uh, the emotions manifest in the body. So um, rather than kind of um, uh, dealing with a constant sort of reactive way of being, uh, you, you sort of learn to sense where feelings are coming up before the kind of, before the reaction takes place. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a kind of training mechanism for kids. Uh, and it's, a skill that is simultaneously kind of being recognized as being increasingly missing um, or uh, fragmented, especially with um, with uh, like mediation through technology, and also um, just just kind of with with uh, with modern overstimulation, um, and it's also being. It's also something that is being recognized as, as being increasingly kind of Im, uh, an important skill to have. This is, um, this is just an image of the first kind of um, work that I made, uh, the first painting object that I made using this plaster technique that I had learned in graduate school. Um, it's named after a, uh, oh my god, I'm blanking. Psych rock, come on. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, and this is another, they're quite small. They were portrait sized and I made a small suite of them. Um, actually, so um, 
Friday, April 10th, 2015, uh, Edward Keenan in the Toronto Star uh, writes about City News Television anchor and Cabbage Town resident Roger Peterson revealed that he had, been, he had received the following handwritten letter um, politely critiquing the condition of his home. So this is from one neighbor to another in Cabbage Town. You may not be aware that as spring approaches, Cabbage Towners try even harder than usual to show off the 19th century heritage of this community. We support these efforts with a June garden tour, many walking tours, and a fall house tour. This street is often visited. It would be appreciated if your home could look a little more like it did in the 1800s. The basketball net might be better in the rear alley, the Christmas lights perhaps to Goodwill, the bicycle stored at the rear, and the general clutter, clutter cleaned up. We would deeply appreciate your attention to this. With thanks, a fellow Cabbage Towner. So interestingly enough, um, Cabbage Town was uh, predominantly settled by uh, immigrants from the Irish potato famine. Um, they were uh, abjectly ridiculed. They were cottage worker houses um, and those, the neighborhood was abjectly ridiculed for what was essentially going on in the front yards, which was subsistence farming of cabbages. Um, there would have been, you know, co cholera outbreaks. There would have been kids playing in the street with sticks and rocks. Um, it's uh, by no means... Um, it's by no means sedum and begonias. Uh, this is um, this is a just a graphic image of what is called a haha, -ha, or it's a, it's a sort of yeah, it's a graphic representation of a haha, -ha, which is was a another kind of Victorian strategy for keeping the margins of the wild at bay. Um, it was essentially, you would build a very deep fence um, and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the top of the fence would come to the edge of the ground, but it was, it was to keep the animals from, from coming into the estate land while still maintaining a perimeter in which you could um, profitably hunt and uh, explore. Um, this is uh, an image of um, an asylum in Australia where they employed the same strategy. So they would have, they would have built these hahas as a perimeter wall to keep the inmates um, in, in the asylum without having the appearance of the perimeter wall existing. So you can see a little bit of how that would have developed. So if, as you, as you sort of move back from the landscape, the ha-ha, the perimeter wall disappears and um, the inmates are still uh, contained inside. I think we're now looking at um, 2011, maybe. I don't know. I can't. I was bad at my own, bad at my own work. Um, bad at time sometimes. So uh, this was a project that I did. I was kind of further deconstructing the painted surface, and um, I was doing a lot of research into this uh, material technique, which is called sprang, which is an old Danish. Um, it's an old Danish. Um, braiding technique that was used to make uh, fish fishing nets and also hair nets and also stockings. Um, and what I've done here and what I did for this body of work is I, I took conventional painter's linen, so the same sub material substrate that you would use to um, make conventional paintings on, and I um, I removed the I removed the um, I removed the weft threads. So I removed the horizontal threads from sections of the grid, and I reworked the internal material in a kind of continu this continuous braided form. And I was really interested in in this um, in this material because it it has essentially, if you pull one thread, the whole thing collapses. It doesn't have a sense of um, it doesn't have a sense of um, scale, like y it kind of takes the shape of whatever it is that goes inside of it. The edges of it are run very runny. Um, and yeah, it, it kind of, it kind of um, follows 
uh, metaphorically, allegorically, materially, what it um, what it is that I am trying to to get to in terms of figure ground relationships. Um, it's also a very uh, labor intensive process. Um, without too much sense of that labor intensity, like it, there's a kind of fragility to the material, but um, there was something very good for me, I think, about learning this 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 kind of very meditative technique. Um, these are the costumes of um, Barbara Stepanova, who was a constructivist textile designer, and she was interested in making sports uniforms for the ideal Soviet socialist citizen. So these were intended to be kind of unisex, um, unisex sporting costumes. Um, and I, I similarly was interested in the the failure of the ideology. That what happens when you when you actually um, place these essentially two-dimensional images onto a three-dimensional body and how the difficulty of materialism sort of um, confronts the, the aspiration of ideology. This is another of that series of works, the step, the um, Sprang work, so the one on the left. Um, the one on the left uh, is your left, yes, it's your left. Um, I, again, I've done the same thing. I've removed the war, the weft, and the one on the right is using a, a Stepanova um, garment pattern. So she also did she also did a number of geometric kind of printed um, motifs. Yeah, here you can here you can get a real sense of the quality of the sprung the material and I've taken just a couple of um, threads or strands and painted them how are we doing for time One thirty. okay we're good it's okay um, I'm just gonna read a little bit of um, Marguerite Duras the lover so she's describing this period of time when she uh, she's in Saigon and she's a young adolescent, and uh, we'll get there, but uh, she's sort of describing a, a her her detaching from her own body. I think it was during this journey that the image became detached, removed from all the rest. It might have existed, a photograph might have been taken, just like any other, somewhere else in another circumstance. But it wasn't, the subject was too slight. Who would have thought of such a thing? The photograph could have only been taken if someone could have known in advance how important it was to be in my life, that event, that crossing of the river. While it was happening, no one even knew of its existence except God, and that's why it couldn't have been otherwise. The image doesn't exist, it was omitted, forgotten. It never was detached or removed from all the rest. And it's to this, this failure to have been created that the image owes its virtue, the virtue of representing, of being the creator of an absolute. I'm wearing a dress of real silk, but it's threadbare, almost transparent. It used to belong to my mother, one day, she decided the color was too light for her, and she gave it to me. It was a sleeveless dress with a very low neck. It's the sepia color real silk takes on with wear. It's a dress I remember. I think it suits me. I'm wearing a leather belt with it, perhaps a belt belonging to one of my brothers. I can't remember the shoes I used to wear in those days, cer only certain dresses. Most of the time, I wore canvas sandals, no stockings. I'm speaking of the time before high school in Saigon. Since then, of course, I've always worn shoes. This particular day, I must be wearing the famous pair of gold lame high heels. I can't see any others I could have been wearing, so I'm wearing them. Bargains, final reductions bought for me by my mother. I'm wearing these gold lame shoes to school, going to school in evening shoes decorated with little diamante flowers. I insist on wearing them. I don't like myself in any others, and to this day, I still like myself in them. These high heels are the first in my life. They're beautiful. They've eclipsed all the shoes that went before, the flat ones, for playing and running about made of white canvas. 
It's not the shoes, though, that make the girl look so strangely, so weirdly dressed. No, it's the fact that she's wearing a man's flat-brimmed hat, a brownish-pink fedora with a broad black, rib black ribbon. The crucial ambiguity of the image lies in the hat. How I came by it, I've forgotten. I can't think of who, who could have given it to me. It must have been my mother who bought it for me because I asked her. The one thing certain is that it was another markdown, another final reduction. Why was it bought? No woman, no girl wore a man's fedora in that colony then. No native woman either. What must have happened is, I tried it on just for fun, looked at myself in the shopkeeper's glass and see that there, behind the man's hat, the thin, awkward shape, the inadequacy of childhood has turned into something else, has ceased to be a harsh, inescapable imposition of nature, has become, on the contrary, a provoking choice of nature, a choice of the mind. Suddenly, it's deliberate. Suddenly, I see myself as another, as another would have seen, outside myself, available to all, available to all eyes, in circulation for cities, journeys, desire. I take the hat and am never parted from it. Having got it, this hat that by all, all by itself makes me whole, I wear it all the time. With the shoes, it must have been much the same, but after the hat, they contradict the hat, as the hat contradicts the puny body, and so they're right for me. I wear them all the time to go everywhere in these shoes, this hat, out of doors, in all weathers, on every occasion, and to town. Um, this is an image of a fairly recent work from a couple of years ago. It's made um, using a, an old marquetry technique, which is called chagrin. And what chagrin is, uh, it was developed um, like, um, it's sort of a uh, decorative purpose comes after a very functional purpose, like many, like many of the things that I'm interested in. It was originally used as um, the first kind of sandpaper to finish wood. What it is, is essentially it's uh, the skin of a dogfish, a shark. Um, initially it was skins of manta rays. And the, these creatures are very interesting because rather than, rather than um, sh all, all sharks actually, but rather than scales, what their, what their bodies are covered with is um, what are called denticles. And it's the same material that, uh, te that human teeth are made of, so it's a very, very, very hard. Um, and when you touch their skin, it's, um, it's, it's, imp it's impenetrable. It's like a kind of mythological dragon skin. Um, and you, there's a real contradiction there um, in terms of the delicacy of how the material feels and looks um, and how f fluid it is and what, what it is actually made of. So these particular works, they are, they are um, they are made out of uh, chagrin. They are uh, dogfish skins. And I have had to um, essentially polish them. And it's, it's like polishing marble. So despite the fact that this is a being's skin, it's hours and hours of grinding away with mechanical means, um, like a very high-powered um, Sand, sand, sanding machine to get it to the point at which it kind of resembles uh, skin, stone, something quite smooth and delicate. Uh, I'll follow with a couple installation shots, but um, this is the back end of where these uh, chagrin works were installed. And um, this is an introduction to the kind of evolution of my material research with plaster. So um, I went from using the kind of architectural plaster that I described earlier to another kind of architectural plaster, which uh, is sometimes called Venetian plaster, although that encompasses a very wide form. But essentially what it is is it's, um, it's plaster with the inclusion of ground marble dust. So you take, you take what essentially is a you take this kind of uh, rock stone formation and grind it, add it to linseed oil and lime putty, um, reconstitute it, and it is applied as an architectural finish. It's quite beautiful. It tends to be quite waterproof, um, or at least water resistant. It can be exterior and interior. It's also the uh, versions of it are the ground from which fresco was made. What 
really strikes me about this material is is the negotiation with it is such that you in order to um, enliven it, in order to get it to the point at which it sort of becomes itself, you push it, you gr you move your body against it, you um, burnish it, you manipulate it with, um, with pressure, with time, with your own body, and it starts to become, it's something close to its uh, its originary source again, but it is a veneer of that source. It's kind of, it's often, it's often sort of, um, it's often used as a substitute for um, the real, the real thing, and it can often feel very, very, very tacky. Um, so this was in Oak Oakville this past summer. I hung three shagreen pieces on one side of the wall and then they were kind of ghosted with these Venetian plaster pieces on the back end of the wall. Um, I'm just gonna take one minute and r read to you the, I just checked this morning and there are I think 15 um, communities in First Nations communities in Ontario uh, for which there are currently a boil water alert. So um, first uh, Fort Albany, the Albany First Nation, um, Pick River. Um, I apologize for my uh, lack of knowledge, but Vega Tong, uh Rama, the Chippewas of Rama First Nation, Deer Lake, and Deer Lake, Hiawatha, the Hiawatha First, First Nation. Keshekawan, um, Keshekawan First Nation. This is hard. Um, Mishkigag among, Mishkigag among First Nation, North Caribou Lake in North Caribou Lake. Um, Oneida, uh, the Oneida of the Tem First Nation. Sachigo Lake, uh, Sachigo Lake First Nation. New Slate Falls, Slate Falls Nation. Uh, Webekwe, uh, Webekwe First Nation. White Sand. Uh, White Sand First Nation, Saugeen of the Ojibwe Nation of Saugeen, um, Saugeen, and another, another uh, Saugeen, the Ojibwe Nation of Saugeen. Um, here we are looking at a graphic of um, what are called interstitial, interstitial mayo fauna. And what interstitial mayofauna are are essentially the organisms that live between um, that live between grains of sand on the beach or um, on the in the in the in the ocean floor, but they live kind of in the transitional zone between um, the 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 land and underwater. So they live in the tide essentially, and they take all kinds of forms, but. Uh, Incidentally, the titles of the works in the gallery space upstairs are um, are all derived from uh, the names, the Latin names of interstitial male fauna. So um, about two and a half billion years ago, there was uh, what is called the um, Great Oxygen Holocaust um, or the Great Oxygenation Event. And what happened at the time is that there were, there was, there were no, um, there was no oxygen, in, there was no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. The um, ocean life was very, um, it was quite populated with um, diverse bacteria, um, but there was, there were no, there were, essentially there were no oxygen producing um, organisms. And what, at the time, uh, something called cyanobacteria began to develop, what we commonly now know as blue-green algae. And this blue-green algae takes the sun's uh, rays and photosynthes photosynthesizes them and um, produces oxygen. Anyway, a chain reaction happened and there was, uh, the Earth's atmosphere got produced and uh, plant life was, was, was also, as we know it now, started to develop um, 
the atmosphere began to the um, uh, combine carbon dioxide and oxygen, and a whole other ecosystem developed. At the same time, uh, there was a the, the Holocaust part comes because all of the existent bacteria in the oceans was uh, pretty much wiped out. Um, we commonly think, yeah, blue blue green algae is something that is um, common in lakes and rivers, um, and uh, works very well with human waste, is happy with human waste. Um, and it's also something that um, we are pop popularly uh, ingesting as spirulina, um, which is kind of touted as a superfood. So we are looking at a garment design, a pattern um, designed by a woman named Madeleine Vionnet, who was um, a turn of the century French uh, garment designer. And she, in essentially she invented the bias cut, which is, um, for those of you who are unaware, most of you are probably very aware, but a bias cut is when you cut fabric along the diagonal. So uh, horizontal, kind of not horizontally, but diagonally across the warp and the weft. And what functionally what that does is it allows um, it allows for stretch and movement in the fabric. Um, it also is extraordinarily kind of beautiful as far as drape is concerned. Um, she was she ended up having a haute couture design house, but she started as a kind of pragmatist and. There were, of course, all kinds of developments going on in European cities at that time, not the least of which was women having the need to A, were a work and B, move freely through the city. Um, I, I, I actually can't, people ask me this, I, I can't quite recall how I came across her garment designs, but um, essentially I was obsessed uh, completely um, in awe of the way in which her mind could see the the very um, the very difficult and uh, un unpredictable boundaries of the human body and map that into two dimensional form in a way that was um, very fluid and very dynamic. I don't think that there was any anybody else who who has has that had that particular kind of mind. Up until that point, um, garments had been very structurally um, organized. They had been very kind of geometrically assembled and there was a lot of hardware <laughs> involved. Um, and, you know, she, she, really, uh, she really was a meta-rationalist, <laughs> this woman, I think. Um, this is an installation that I did using one of her um, one of her cut patterns at uh, Cooper Cole about a year ago in Toronto, and uh, it's using that same Venetian plaster. Which, if you've seen the show upstairs, it it has a kind of um, it has a kind of luminosity and tackiness, and uh, and also this kind of like glorious um, reflective sensibility to it. Um, it has a, yeah, it has a kind of dimensionality to it. Move. There we go. Um, so uh, this is a part of the same exhibition. I also plastered the outlets, the sort of orifices and openings in the floor through which power came um, with using the same, using the same sets of materials. Yeah, I believe this is the last sort of set of w my own work that I'm going to show. But this was the first. This is my first kind of um, experimentation with using Venetian plaster directly on the walls. And what you're looking at is a combination of um, of a, 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 a slightly older sculpture, which is called a Proposal for a Viewing Apparatus. And what it is, the sculpture in the center of the room, it was modeled after. A, um, it was modeled after the uh, theater prop um, form for a, um, 
this character called Mother Ginger from The Nutcracker. And who Mother Ginger is, is she, she doesn't actually have a lot of movement. She just is on stage and she, uh, she has this giant skirt and all the, there's a whole bunch of kind of like babies that come flushing out from underneath her skirt. But she doesn't, she doesn't have a great part of the dance. She just kind of sways. So this is the, this is the architecture, the armature, um, or a version of it, uh, a sort of, um, a sort of uh, archaeological ver version of it that uh, that sh would have kind of held her held her and her skirt up. So that's that's the um, that's the sort of this shape that you see. And the other part of it is um, the viewing apparatus part of it um, is uh, these domes, these uh, pink glass balls that are filled with um, gluten-free corn macaroni. On the walls, you see a, a rudimentary um, bias cut dress form that is in uh, in the process of emerging. So the the image on the left is the kind of folded form as it would have been cut, and then it uh, it folds out and folds out to become to become the the garment. So I just um, I just wanted to I just wanted to close talking about um, talking about uh, somebody whose name is uh, Evelyn Fox Keller, and she uh, she she was. Um, physicist, but um, she, she won the Nobel, the, she was actually the first woman to win a, a Nobel Prize for, in, in her field, but she, what she, and forgive me because me, like, studying this information is a little bit like, uh, it's a little bit like, um, uh, you know, looking at Blondgard problems. I'm a little, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a bit out of my depth, but what what I understand of her research is that she she um, she was looking at um, what you know the multi kind of multicolored corn. Um, she was studying what is conventionally called Indian corn, and she couldn't she couldn't figure out what the genetic the DNA pattern was um, for the emergence of. The, the color patterns in um, in corn, so there wasn't it didn't follow the kind of it didn't follow the regular um, stratification for for DNA patterns, and she proposed to her colleagues that something else was going on, um, and they didn't they didn't believe her for a very long time, <laughs> partially because the way that she engaged with study. Um, the way that she engaged with study was uh, as a kind of form of consistent looking. Um, she 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 went from a hunch. She went from actually, you know, the image the image that is described by uh, this scientific historian named Barbara McClintock is that she just spent a long time looking at this corn, and uh, and and obviously studying its DNA, but um, trying to get a what is what she would call a feeling for the organism. Um, so quoting Barbara McClintock writing about, um, writing about Evelyn Fox Keller um, from a book that's called A Feeling for the Organism, uh, she says her answer is simple. Over and over again, she tells us one must have the time to look the patience to hear what the material has to say to you, the openness to let it come to you. Above all, must, one must have a feeling for the organism. One must understand how it grows, understands its parts, understand when something is going wrong with it. An organism isn't just a piece of plastic, it's something that is constantly being affected by the environment, constantly showing attributes or disabilities in its growth. You have to be aware of all of that. You need to know how these plants, know these plants well enough so that if anything changes, you can look at the plant and right away you know, 
you know what this damage you see is from something that scraped across it or something that bit at it or something that the wind did. You need to have a feeling um, for every individual plant. No two plants are exactly alike. They're all different, and as a consequence, you have to know that, that difference, she explains. I start with the seedling, and I don't want to leave it. I don't feel I really know the story if I don't watch the plant all the way along. So I know every plant in the field. I know them intimately, and I find it a great pleasure to know them. So what she discovered is something that were called transposons. And it, essentially what, it, what I understand it to be is that um, they're kind of like jumpers from DNA material. So it's DNA material, it's, like it's like a parasitic um, portion of DNA material that goes from, from, from one strand to another. This is, uh, if, if there's anybody who understands this better, I may be completely embarrassing myself, but um, this is what I kind of understand. And there, there is also a relationship between this and the contemporary study of what is called epigenetics, um, which is uh, the study of how gene material can change over, um, over time. So pr prior, to this, prior to this kind of discovery of transposons, um, DNA, genetic material, had been understood to be these kind of complete set maps, this kind of flat earth phenomenon where it, you, when you got to the edge of the sequencing, you would, you would run off the edge. And she, she, she changed kind of fundamentally the notions of how, how, we, how, we, how we can look at genetic material as a kind of, um, as she describes this kind of unique and um, interactive kind of space. I think I'm gonna stop there. I, uh, I won't. I won't give too many ap apologies of material I didn't cover. But I really, actually, would welcome. I'm assuming that most of you have gone to see the show, but I would really welcome um, any really pragmatic questions, um, thoughts about the material or the stuff that you saw in the exhibition. I like to answer uh, all kinds of things. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much, Beth. If anyone has a question, let us know and we'll hand you the microphone. Um, I really enjoyed the show so much that I went four or five times. <laughs> um, but I had a question about your square piece. Was it all one block, or did you dye each um, square individually and then put it together? The are you you're talking about the the like uh, the yellow hanging costume that's on the wall? No, when you first walk in. Yeah. Um, it's the the checkerboard looking one. Yeah. Is yeah. it, I was just wondering if you dyed the pieces individually and then put them together, or was it one piece and then you dyed it? Well, you know, uh, it was dyed. It was yeah. dyed by a lovely and talented individual named Heather Goodchild, and she dyed each piece of fabric individually, yeah, and then it was assembled, yeah. Okay. That's oh, that one. piece. <laughs> oh, I see, I see, I see. That's the one. That's yeah, the one. Thank okay. You. Um, so the the negotiation with the the works in those plaster works in the show it, it's it really ended up being this kind of combination of like kind of traditional painting methodologies and and more architectural finishes so that particular one was a com it was a it was an additive and reductive thing so there's actually like some of those squares are like were applied with a trowel and then finished with wax paste. Some of them were top treated with painting. Some of them, all of them, probably had some pigment in the in the plaster. But essentially, yeah, I um, I it, each one was kind of each little square was done in individually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really that one probably more than any of them, except for maybe the pizza painting. That one is that one is a, that one's kind of like a painting. You know, yeah. like I. I painted it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, Katie. Hey. Uh, can I ask you, it's, a, I think, a very simple question, but um, maybe if you have any thoughts about how you consider the space of the exhibition, um, mm -hmm. the way that the space of this exhibition feels like it's been considered very much in its totality, the way that um, it's installed makes me think of sort of an echo between the interior space of the bathing machine, the space of the gallery, the way having the machine outside creates sort of this activation back and forth. Um, and the really like, complete treatment of the space, the floor, the walls, um, and then the works on the walls. Just maybe, yeah, like how, how you think about those things, like why for you there is a sense of the completeness being engaged in the space. Um, I think it's two parts. Like I think, I, I think the simple, the simplest, um, the simplest part is that I did want to have a sense of, sense of passage through something, um, and I know it, you don't. It's not a continuous passage through because the gallery doesn't have a doesn't have a ass end. Like it doesn't have a doesn't have an out. Um, but I did want to have this kind of sen sense of like ri like ritual passage through a space. Um, that's maybe the sim most simple answer. And that there were some metaphorical things that I wanted, like I wanted the interior part to feel a bit like a beach or to feel a bit like a physical, like a body interior. Um, but the, I think the, the more kind of complicated answer is that I have been more and more thinking about, um, you know, I have this habit or this preoccupation with, um, no, like get kind of the work becoming itself through its making this like it's very much like a practice and uh, and what happens when you bring objects that are engaged in materially engaged in that manner into a finished r like white room there's a kind of there's a difficulty with that so uh, this is the second time around that I've wanted to try to engage with the space in the same way that I engage with all of the other kind of materials that I use, which is to kind of figure out what they are as I'm, as I'm making them and let, like, let that kind of, um, emergence happen. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it was important to do that. I did come in obviously with an idea of like our, like the measurements and the kind of general, um, sp space, but, uh, then from there, there was a kind of a lot of negotiation with how how it would sort of come to life. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody? Hi, Beth. Um, I was wondering if it's important for you or how you think about the viewer kind of engaging in, because it seems like the, the objects have this kind of history or reach back or this background, um, and which seems, which is like very enlivening for me to kind of hear about that, uh, that history. And I'm wondering how you, especially like the dress structure that you were mentioning, um, how do you see the viewer kind of engaging with that history, maybe through the object, if that makes sense? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I like, I, like anybody who has a kind of um, research practice that is more textual, it's, um, it's kind of a, a struggle with um, sometimes wanting to give some information, but not too much information, and not wanting the work to feel reductive or yeah or or too much a kind of like some of its textual research components um so i always have this goal of if if people didn't know anything of the material that i just presented to you that there would still be some kind of felt sense of um like to distill it down when I said that I have a, I'm, I think about figure ground relationships. 
I, to be a little bit more specific with that, I, I want to have a kind of malleability uh, between the figure and the ground, a space in which the viewer kind of gets pushed back and forth between what is what is hard, what is soft, what is old, what is new, what is um, what is heavy, what is light, um, that the, the, the work can act, kind of act like a diaphragm. So hopefully there's a kind of like material sensibility that, that, um, that the work kind of operates in, in that way. I don't know that, uh, I don't, I, I would hope that it, it kind of is, is generous enough, like materially kind of generous enough. And, and I mean that in the, in the real sense of like seduction and beauty and, and yeah, um, this kind of, um, I lost it. Uh, yeah, this kind of um, tenderness and all that kind of stuff that it would it would lend itself at le if not to the if not to the like if not to these histories at least to my ex my experience of dealing with them like um, but that you know that that I mean that remains to be seen you know that I I hope the best of the work does that. Yeah. I think when you mentioned the a feeling for the organism and this kind of practice of looking and feeling, when I engage with your work, I it operates that way for me. So it's thank you. Oh, hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> um I may have missed this, but I would really like to hear you tell us a little bit about how humor plays a part in what you do, because that's, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how much of this is um, my, like, my going to art school in the 90s, kind of needing to have this sort of, like, self-reflexive, um, uh, self-reflexive art about art kind of um, pun kind of punchiness or sense of humor in the painting there's always this kind of like reflex in me to not take it all too seriously um, but I also I also think so like to be really concrete the ma like the macaroni or the pizza or um, you know a sense of like bodily or physical forms there's like some 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 humor there I feel like there's less and less humor but um it is it is kind of important I think it it just kind of it just kind of humanizes things um I mean I could talk specifically about what why the pizza or like <laughs> Brendan's nodding. Yes, please. Why the pizza? Well, it's it's funny because uh, like Justine came into the studio and I had this also had this conversation with um, uh, some other people and the reaction to the pizza painting was kind of like either very much yes or very much no, um, and uh, that it, it sort of sets itself aside from the other work. Um, and I, I think I do that all the time. I always want to put some kind of image based thing in and, you know, often it's food because food is funny. You put it in your mouth, it comes out your bum. It's like a funny thing. Um, I, I, I also think that, um, you know, the, the pizza in particular, it's a, it's like a, a nod to the, the like Italianate nature of the material. Um, it talks about like whiteness and consumption and a kind of like cult cultural blanketing that capitalism <laughs> deals with. It's like, um, uh, you know, it's also this, it's also, it's also, um, yeah, it's sort of like, it's like a grounding, it's like a lodestone kind of grounding device for me. And I, I feel for better or worse that I, I, al it's, I always have to ha have that kind of joker in the back of the room who 
says, it also, for me, it grounds it in the, con in the contemporary, and I don't mean the contemporary in terms of contemporary art, but when I have so much kind of historically laden material or the objects start to feel like they are from a, uh, a, a projected future or from deep in the past, what the humor tends to do is to draw you right back to where you are, draw you right back to a sense of engagement with the present. Um, which is important, I think. If there are no more questions, once again, we'll extend our sincere thanks to Beth Stewart for coming to talk about our work.